everyone. I'm off. Today I got these sorry. There are three pages from a friend which we set our book club meeting on Saturday and I assign a friend to provide the story for us to read and this is what I just got from her now. I would like to read and let's see what words I can't pronounce correct. Thomas, not Thomas, sorry, three old L. Thomas. Robert Proctor was a good driver for so young a man. The turnpike curved gently ahead of him. Lily traveled on his cool morning in May. He felt relaxed and alert. Two hours of driving had not yet produced the twinges of fat guilt. Twin, twinks, twinges. <laughs> I'm not sure if this is supposed to be twinges or just twinks. That appears first in the muscles in the base of the neck. The sun was bright but not glaring, and the air smelled fresh and clean. He breathed it deeply and breathed out noisily. It was a good day for driving. He glanced quickly at the slim, gray-haired woman sitting in the front seat with him. Her mouth was curved in a quiet smile. She watched the trees and the fields slip by on her sides of the pike. Robert Proctor immediately looked back at the road. He said, Enjoying it, man. Yes, Robert. Her voice was as cool as the morning. <laughs> it is very pleasant to sit here. I was thinking some of the driving I did for you when you were little. I wonder if you enjoy it as much as I enjoy this. He smiled and breathed. Sure, I did. She reached over and patted him gently on the arm and then turned back to the scenery. He listened to the smooth purr of the engine. Up ahead, he saw a great truck spouting a great sir of smoke as it sped along the turnpike. Behind it, not passing it, was a long blue convertible continued to drive in the wake of the truck. Robert Proctor noted that a rich man and filled it in the back of his mind. He was slowly overtaking them, but he would not reach them for another minute or two. He listened to the pull of the engine, and he was pleased with the sound. He had turned that engine himself over the objections of the mechanic. The engine idled rough now, but it ran smoothly at high speed. You need a special feel to do good work on engines, and Robert Pogner knew he had it. No one in the world had a feel like his for the tune of an engine. It was a good morning for driving, and his mind was filled with good thoughts. He pulled nearly a breast of the blue control and began to pass it. His speed was a few miles per hour above the turnpike limit, but his car was under perfect control. The blue convertible suddenly swung out from behind the truck. It swung out with a warning and struck his car near the right front fender, knocking his car to the shoulder on the left side. Of the turnpike lane. Robert Proctor was a good driver, too wise to slam on the brakes. He forced the steering wheel to hold the car on a straight path. The left wheel sank into the soft left shoulder, and the car tucked to pull to the left and cross the island and enter the lanes carrying the car's heading in the opposite direction. He held its then the wheel struck a rock bury in the soft dirt, and the left front tire broke out. The car slowed, and it was then that his mother began to scream. The car turned sideways and skidded past off the way 
out into the other lanes. Robert Parker fought against the steering wheel to straighten the car, but the drags of the brown tire was too much. The scream rang steadily in his ears, and even as he strained at the view, one part of his mind wondered coolly how a scream could so long be sustained without a breath. An oncoming car struck his radiator from the side and spun him viciously, full into the left hand lens. He was flung into his mother's lap, and she was thrown against the right door. It held. With his left hand, he reached for the steering wheel and pulled himself erect against the force of the spin. He turned the wheel to the left and tried to stop the spin and carry it out of the lens of oncoming traffic. His mother was unable to rise herself. She lay against the door, her cry rising and falling with the eccentric spin of the car. The car lost some of its momentum. During one of the spins, he twisted the wheel straight, and the car wobblingly stopped spinning and headed down the lane. Before Robert Proctor could turn it off, the pipe to safety a car loomed ahead of him. Bearing down on him, there was a man at the wheel of that other car, sitting rigid, unable to move. Eyes wide and staring and filled with fright. Alongside the man was a girl, her head against the back of the seat, soft curls framing a lovely face, her eyes closed in easy sleep. It was not the fear in the man that reached into Robert Proctor. It was the trusting helplessness in the face of the sleeping girl. The two cars sped closer to each other, and Robert Proctor could not change the direction of his car. The driver of the other car remained frozen at the wheel. At the last moment, Robert Proctor sat motionless, staring into the face of the onrushing sleeping girl. His mother's cry still sounding in his ears. He heard no crash. When the two cars collided head on at a high rate of speed, he felt something push into his stomach, and the world began to go gray. Just before he lost consciousness, he heard the screaming stopped, and he knew then that he had been hearing a single, short leaves scream that had only seemed to drag on and on. There came a painless wrench, and then darkness. Robert Proctor seemed to be at the bottom of a deep black well. There was a spot of faint light in the far distance, and he could hear the rumble of a distant voice. He tried to pull himself toward the light and the sound, but the effort was too great. He lay still and gathered himself and tried again. The light grew brighter and the voice louder. He tried harder again, and he drew closer. Then he opened his eyes full and looked at the man sitting in front of him. "You all right, son?" asked the man. He wore a blue uniform, and his brow, b e f r i n d face was familiar. Robert Proctor tentatively moved his head and discovered he was seated in a reclining chair, unharmed and able to move his arms and legs with no trouble. He looked around the room, and he remembered the man in the uniform saw the growing intelligence in his eyes, and he said, "No harm done, son." You just took the last pass of your driver's test. Robert Proctor focused his eyes on the man. Though he saw the man clearly, he seemed to see the faint face of the sleeping girl in front of him. The uniformed man continued to speak. 
If you draw an accident under hypnosis, do it to everybody these days before they can get their driver's licenses. Makes better drivers of them. More careful drivers the rest of their lives. Remember it now? Coming in here and all? Robert Proctor nodded, thinking of the sleeping girl. She never would have awoken. She would have passed right from a sweet, temporary sleep into the dark, heavy sleep of death. Nothing in between. His mother would have been bad enough. After all, she was pretty old. The sleeping girl was downright waste. The uniformed man was still speaking. So you're all set now. You can pay the ten dollar fee and sign this application, and we'll have your license in the mail in a day or two. He did not look up. Robert Proctor placed a ten dollar bill on the table in front of him, glanced over the application, and signed it. He looked up to find two white uniformed men standing, one on each eye of him. And he frowned in annoyance. He started to speak, but the uniformed man spoke first. Sorry, son, you fell. You're sick. You need treatment. The two men lifted Robert Proctor to his feet, and he said, Take your hands off me. What is that? The uniformed man said, Nobody should want to drive a car after going through what you just went through. It should take months before you can even think of driving again. But you're ready right now. Killing people doesn't bother you. We don't let your car run around loose in society anymore. But don't you worry now, son. They'll take good care of you and they'll fix you up. He nodded to the two men and they began to march Robert Proctor out. At the door, he spoke. And his wife was so urgent, the two men paused. Robert Proctor said, You can't really mean this. I'm still dreaming, aren't I? This is still part of the test, isn't it? The uniformed man said, How do any of us know? And then dragged Robert Proctor out the door, knees stiff, feet dragging. His rubber heels sliding along the two groups, one into the floor. From the magazine of Fantasies and Science Fictions, copyright 1962 by Mercury Press, used by permissions of the author. The end.